I'm Charles Madede. Um, I'm a, a writer and a filmmaker, and um, and that's and I and I read books. And that's me. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Peter Fraze. I live in the Hudson Valley of New York, a little bit north of New York City. I, I write. I wrote a book called Four Futures, as Philip just mentioned. I've written for Jacobin, Commune, other places, and and I don't like work. And we'll get into why that is, I suppose, as we go on. Uh, I'm Michael Hart, and I teach at Duke University. Uh, that's, I, that's it. Um, I'm, I'm Kathy Weeks, and I live between Durham, North Carolina, and Seattle. And I don't like work either. And we can talk about it. Great. So um, um, I. I, I I, I think Peter should start with the, and then I will follow, and I think Kathy, you'll be next, mm -hmm. and then we'll conclude with Michael. Um, so, yeah, um, first of all, this is very dis it's disconcerting, these very bright lights and your very dark faces. Uh, I, it's, I, I, I feel, I, since Philip already brought up Star Trek, if anybody in the audience knows Star Trek The Next Generation, I feel like I'm in the episode where the Cardassian is interrogating Captain Picard uh, with the bright lights in my faces, but uh, be that as it may, um, the, so, down with work is the tagline of this, uh, this panel or this discussion or this, this interaction, uh, which on the one hand is sort of perfect for me and perfectly straightforward. I, I don't like work. I haven't liked work ever since as a child I came to understand what, what, I, came, what I came to believe work seemed to be in the adult world. Um, I had, you know, I grew up, I, you know, I grew up in a fairly fortunate situation with a father who is an academic, who had, you know, in a, in a fairly comfortable academic job, who had what appeared to me to be the closest thing to, to not working that, that seemed to be available compared to what the parents of, of other people that I knew had. You know, he was around when other people weren't and seemed to have autonomy to do what it was he wanted to do. Of course, I came to understand that things were a bit more complicated than that, but nevertheless, it's not wrong to say as... Uh, as the sociologist Stanley Aronowitz once did, that what my father had was the last good job in America. Um, which, which gets to this question of, of what are we talking about when we talk about work and why would we be against it? And I, I think it's one of these questions that's useful to ask because it's at one, at one level it seems completely obvious. It's this ubiquitous thing, work. It's part of our lives. It's a thing that we have to like or dislike or submit to or depend on, um, but what do we mean when we talk about work? And the first thing that leaps to mind uh, for most people, I think, when you say work is the job, or it's the, more generally, it's the things that you have to do in order to procure your means of survival. And that in itself takes various forms. It can be the wage in the form uh, of an hourly wage that you get paid for working, you know, whether it's in a factory or in a restaurant or whatever, but it can be a salary job that isn't tied to hours. It can be freelance work, as more and more of us do, that's tied to the particular gig. It, you know, our, our, our work activity that we get paid for can be legal or illegal. It can be, you know, it can be sort of uh, condoned or or persecuted by the state. But we, we begin with that, um, I think that assumption, which most of us brought up in a capitalist society like this one, take for granted that that's sort of what, what work is. It's what you do in return for money, usually or some way of accessing the means of subsistence. Um, and most of us have the experience, directly or indirectly, of that generally not being uh, something that we do for primarily because we take any value out of it other than it's what pays the bills. And yet, when you start to talk about being, you know, critical of work or post-work or anti-work or, or various other ways that we talk about this, this gets mixed up with, I would say, at least two other very distinct things that come up uh, when we say what is work. Um, the first is what you might call the necessary labor of society, and that's a, it's a vague term, and it's a vague term intentionally because this is a, what you would call a, an essentially contested category. It's something that we debate. What is, exact, what is necessary? That is to say, what would you say uh, has to get done for our, for our way of life to go on as we 
think it ought to. And that can mean social reproduction in the sense of the physical reproduction of the species. Somebody has to, somebody is doing the work of raising children, whether or not they're getting paid for it. Often they're not getting paid for it. Um, and, but there's also the, you know, the, the labor of keeping the roads paved or the buses and trains running or not running. Um, that is something that we, we think of as something that has to be done and therefore deserves, either deserves respect or at least deserve, needs to have some mechanism in place to make sure someone does it. So that's the second sense of work. It's the stuff that has to get done. Um, whether or not it's, you know, however it's being compensated, however it's being organized. And then the final sense of work that sometimes comes up, and it's a thing that I get even from leftists when they say what's, you know, when I talk about oh, post-work, anti-work, whatever, is, well, are you, you know, what about the fact that people want to commit themselves to projects that require dedication and discipline and self-sacrifice that they often ultimately find fulfilling? Are you against that? Are you saying everyone must sort of lie in a hammock all day or something? And well, no, not unless that's what you want to do, and sometimes that is what I want to do. But of course, uh, there is, you know, in some ways, to reject work as whatever it is you have to do to get paid can be to open up the space for whatever it is that you might want to do or whatever it is that might need to get done. Um, and so to, I wanted to sort of start and just sort of set the stage with that, that, that tripartite distinction between work as what it is you get paid for, work as what needs to be done, work as what you find fulfilling or self-actualizing or however you want to put it, and how those things overlap or don't overlap. That it's sometimes possible to kind of have, uh, you know, to sort of have an alibi by saying, you know, that what, it, what you do is work and therefore makes you, that you've proved your worth to society because you do something that you receive a paycheck for. Whatever the content of that thing is, is, is secondary to that. And so, I've, you know, I've done a variety of jobs, including ones where the content of it is things like going through uh, and filing rejected applications for health insurance for a private health insurance company. It's, the content of that work is both inhuman and its immediate impact, denying people health care, and is part of a larger system that should not exist, and even kind of a basic social democratic view of the world in which we should have universal single-payer health care, and nobody should be sitting at a computer logging in rejected applications for health insurance. And yet, I got paid money for that. I took home a paycheck every week. And so I was, by that standard, by the standard that work is what you get paid for, and that, that, and that, what you, that getting paid for something makes you a contributing member of society, I was a contributing member of society. Um, whereas someone who was doing something that we might regard as necessary for the reproduction of society, such as raising children, if they're not getting paid for it, it doesn't necessarily have the same social standing, not to even speak of the things that we do in the time freed up, art or sports or writing, you know. Um, and so that's, that's sort of where I could go on, but I, I won't, because uh, this, is, I think, opens up a, a very complicated conversation that I hope we can have together about um, starting with the provocation down with work and opening into the the, yeah, maybe the political conversation of what is work, how do we define it, how are we sort of politically and culturally constrained to think of what work is or isn't and what makes it valuable or not valuable. Um, how, how does work define us both in terms of providing us access to the material means to live and also to the, the kind of the cultural markers that allow us to be treated as if we are full or contributing members of society. Um, and so I'll sort of, I think I want to just leave that at that sort of level of generality because I know my, uh, my co-contributors here have uh, interesting directions to go with it. Um, so I will, we'll stop there and, uh, and hand it off. My God, that's a lot. <laughs> um, uh, now in the introduction I used the word intervention, but I would, I want to switch it to provocation, if you don't mind. I'm, be I'm being an editor, okay, I'm sorry. I, I heard him use provocation. I said I would have preferred to use that word instead of intervention. Um, I, um, <laughs> I want to, um, first of all, um, open with something that happened to me recently. Um, I wrote a piece, I write for The Stranger, and I wrote a piece about homelessness again. And, um, and uh, I was sort of asking people, basically, um, 
that homelessness, um, what does it mean? It means that you're basically punishing someone from uh, being a human. I mean, essentially, that's what it came down to. You're saying that I, is, what poverty does is just attempts to do is to isolate you and, and to prevent you from connecting with other humans, and so you cannot um, flourish. I made this argument broadly. And I received a letter this morning from somebody, you know, and uh, they said, um, get a real job. <laughs> And I was fascinated by this. I said, get a real job. And then they, they went to explain what a real job is. It says, um, you could, uh, you, know, you know, if you were a police officer, and I said, oh, a police officer is a real job. <laughs> According to his logic, you would know what it means to work. And, or a business owner, too. <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't do any of those. And... Um, <laughs> But I love the fact that he just, he discredited me as being somebody who did not work. Even though I received a paycheck, I mean, by all definitions, but my, I was fascinated by this. Like, this is, must be, you know, I thought this was not singular. This was not, like, accidental. That, that the policeman does a real job. You know what I mean? And I wanted, I wanted to, I'm sorry, bring, I brought this up by accident. Because I, I can't, I, I'm sorry, it, it entered my mind a few minutes ago. And I said, I wanted to bring it up. Because I'm, I'm thinking about it. What does it mean to say a, bis, a policeman is real work? You know what I mean? I mean, a prison guard then like, I must, must be up there as well. You know what I mean? As the ideal work and so on. So, on. so I, I wanted to just to bring that out. I do not, I do not have a job by the definition of this person, which I thought that was fair. I, maybe not, maybe he's right. Maybe he's not, he's not, he's not I mean, maybe I shouldn't be so quick to, to judge his, uh, his standards. You know what I mean? Maybe he's correct. Real work is either making money or beating down people who do not want to make money and I, I, or who are not making money and so forth and so on. And so uh, I, wanted, I wanted to open with that, first of all. The second thing I wanted to talk about is UFOs. I'm sorry, I'm, just, I'm, I'm trying to make this as short as possible. I, I really do. I, I know we're, we're rushed. Um, and I, 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 if I go over, forgive me. Um, um, you can, yeah, whatever. All right, so here it is, um, the UFO. I, I was interested in UFOs. Um, for, for one, of course, there's recent stories about the Navy dealing with UFOs and all that stuff. But I was interested in how we see UFOs in, uh, in films. And... Uh, it was always it was um, something where some highly um, advanced uh, um, animal um, um, has apparently uh, reached Earth from somewhere distant and has this technology which is incredibly um, sophisticated because how else could you travel the vast spaces uh, between the stars, right, and to arrive at, at a place and. And, and, and appear in our skies. And I, and I thought, you know, we always never think, like, what does it mean that a UFO is in the sky, right? I mean, we have, a, we have television series, we have movies, and, right? and always wondered, like, what, what, is it, what is a UFO, essentially? And I came to the question, I, I, I went to the next question for me. It's like, well, you know, um, how is it um, this particular animal from space, I mean, suppose it's an animal, I suppose it's, primarily made of carbon, I mean, I hope, I, uh, uh, whatever, you know, I mean, you get the idea, right? It has to be alive. And um, there's only so many elements in so forth and so on, and carbon is really popular with life, so I suspect it's, you know, <laughs> that's what's going on here. So it arrives in the sky, and you think like, okay, there's this UFO, that means it's technologically advanced. And so the question is, what is technological advancement? Right? That's the next question. What is technology? They obviously have serious technology. And how is it they came about having this technology? And we often miss this. And I, it's a question that I, I brought up in another, another seminar with Afrofuturists as to how do we imagine technology? And what does it mean? I mean, why did a, 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 a particular um, spe uh, animal in space find, have the... Have the the, 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 the know-how to make something that flies through uh, the vast emptiness of space, right, to differ between different stars and the solar systems and so on and so on. And um, in that, where I, this is where I stopped the question, right, what is this thing? And we don't consider it enough. 
because we almost accept technology to be something um, um, natural, like it develops um, um, expectedly, as if um, all of our human history was leading to uh, technological advancement. We almost would say that the dinosaurs suffered because they didn't figure this out. But we came along and we determined that um, history has a trajectory and it is greater and greater technological complexity. And we take that, we take that as obvious but we don't understand where, what drove technological progress. We never sit down and, and analyze this aspect. Now, I'm gonna cut this short talk, this, 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 this uh, talk short because I know it could go on forever, um, and um, it has done that in another seminar. But um, I, I wanna cut to the person, to, 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 to the answer, to the possible answer for this, is we often, we often, um, we often think, if you look at human history, essentially, um, there, there, there's no advancement. There's no technological progress. It's a, it's a reticular, actually, right? Things are gained and things are lost. Um, there is no, there's no, there's no, you know, specific narrative of improvement, as the Victorians tried to imagine it, that we get better and better. There's none of that. I mean, that's all quite recent. It's very new in the world, but yet we take this experience that's quite new and we impose it on the past. And we say uh, technology, that we were all, that the humans came out of Africa, we've accepted that now, finally. And, uh, and that they, uh, and that this was, this was, and then they, and then it was just natural that they just went in this direction of better, better tools, the, the, the you know, uh, better and better uh, ways of, um, of fishing, of, um, of boating, of so forth and so on. And we accept this as, a, and so we accept this to the point where we see it connected with our moment of rapid technological expansion, right? And then that's my, that's my next point. So we, we see it as transhistorical essentially, and we, we write that. And that's how we see the UFOs, I suspect, is we have to say that in the galaxy, there's a trans-historical galactic uh, progression, you know, in the Victorian sense, right? The Victorians were looking at the stars, Cecil Rhodes and so forth, and saw this was uh, widespread, galactic spread, right? But, and this was an imposition. But what we're doing actually is imposing what we have experienced over the past 300 years on a wide area of human um, experience. That was not at all progressive, right? So I'm gonna stop, that's my next, my, then my, my conclusion. My, my, so what, what uh, I, I, I like to point out is that, and this, this, I'm, I borrow heavily at this point from Mo, Mo, Moshi uh, Poststone and um, and uh, who I read with uh, Phil Walsetter about two years ago, and uh, and I've sort of yeah been involved in, in his thoughts um, um, during the, this, uh, the past two years. But what what uh, what's interesting to me is um, well, first of all, um, no, 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 I'm not going to go. I'm going to try to make this short. What's <laughs> what's interesting to me is that he is that um, he points out that the the the, the motor of progress, the thing that drives it, is not actually some kind of human uh, feeling or drive or, you know, you know, um, um, innate sense of progress or whatever. What's been driving progress instead has been um, the struggle between capitalists and workers, and the struggle is this: um, that one wants to cut down costs, and the other wants to demand more pay uh, to, for the work that they do. And so in this dynamic, um, the capitalists have been um, pushing forward uh, technological development, meaning that what, we, what we're seeing instead is a, um, a drive towards higher and greater and more complex machines and so forth and so on for the purpose of cutting down costs. Now, you could say, okay, that's, I'm gonna, um, you, we can talk about this later, but you can say, okay, how, that, how is that possible? And so on and so on. But I, I want to conclude by showing like this is not over. I mean, you, we can find this all the way back to the Dutch moment in capitalism and also to what's happening right now with Boeing. I mean, if you look at the whole situation with the um, Max 
uh, planes, what is what is what was that about? What, what, why were those people dying and falling out of the sky? It was because the the technology in the plane was supposed to make um, pilots cheaper. That 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 was the the essential goal of the design process at Boeing was that they wanted to develop a plane that did not require that much training, right? If you look at them, if you read, if you, if you read the, um, the, 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 the reports coming in from those um, close to the development of the plane, that's, that's, that was the stated idea. And so um, we have not left this. So if you look at the t the, all the technology that's being packed in this plane, and the, way, the fact that we sort of say that, oh, it's advancement, but it's not advancement. What it is, and it's always been, according to Postone, and I'm gonna conclude on this point, because we need to think about what work means in this context, and what, we, what technological development means, is that um, what we find is that there has, that, that most of what's driven, what the, the main driving force of, um, of, of rapid technological change is, um, is rooted in a class struggle um, whereby wages are a problem and uh, profits are the goal. And, and, and it's, we shouldn't mystify technology. Um, we, should, we should see it in these terms. Now I'll stop with that. Thank you. Okay, so this is so weird because I cannot, we cannot see your faces. It's the oddest, oddest thing. Okay, so we're, we're as we keep saying, this non-panel provocation is, we're, we're gently trying to help you understand that the audience participation part is coming. And so we're really <laughs> hoping that you will co-theorize with us because we want to think critically about work. And I think we've only been able to skim the surface on the critique of work. I think we really need a lot more people trying to think about what work is today, the experience of it in relationship to what our expectations and our desires for it are. So I've got two sets of questions that I would really like you to, if possible, help me think about. And since it's Red May, I'm gonna start with Marx for the first one. So Marx centered his critique of capitalism on the experience of waged work under industrialization. And whereas a lot of others had, and still do, think of the waged worker as um, a free person, right? Someone who gets to sort of negotiate a wage contract with someone else, and, as, and, and in fact, the epitome of what it means to be independent. Like, so strangely, if you're dependent on the state for your income, you're dependent, but if you're dependent on an employer for income, you're independent. I mean, it's just, it's an odd little kind of rabbit out of the hat sort of thing, but it, it's often understood that the wage worker is free and equal. And so the story goes that a wage worker goes into the job market and they negotiate with other free and equal people who are employers and everyone has something to trade. So the employer has money and the worker has labor power. So they meet as equals and then they work out a beneficial bargain, right? And that's the story. And so what Marx did is he said, um, he said, what you have to do is find out what happens after they sign the contract. So he says, let us, in company with the owner of money and the owner of labor power, leave this noisy sphere with er where everything takes place on the surface in plain view of everyone and follow them into the hidden abode of production. Right here, we will find the secret of how capital, and I would add workers, are made into capital and workers. Right, and so he says you have to go down and look at people at work and find out what they're doing to find out how capitalism works. And he says once we do this and we go down into the workplace, we see a change in our dramatis personae. He who was previously the money owner now strides out in front as the capitalist. The per, the uh, possessor of labor power follows as his worker, right? So now, once we go down, we see that now we see class inequality, right? Where they, we had imagined that they were equals. Once we go into the workplace, one strikes out in front and the other follows. Then we can see class inequality at the point of production, right? And then he continues. The one, the capitalist, smirks self-importantly and is intent on business. The other is timid and holding back like someone who has brought his own hide to market and now has nothing else to expect but a hiding. 
right? So now we even see subordination and unfreedom, not just inequality, right? We see domination in the relationships of work. And it seems to me it's not just the appropriation of the surplus value that the worker creates during the workday that's hidden from view, but also the hierarchy and domination and inequality and unfreedom of waged work is also sort of strangely hidden from view or not talked about, right? These relations of domination and subordination, these workplace hierarchies aren't usually seen as such, in part because they take place in this hidden abode of production, this private realm, right? So I, the first question I'm interested in, or set of question, is how do we publicize and politicize and deepen our understanding of how people expect, experience hierarchies at their jobs? And I'm thinking about different jobs. Like, how often are these, these right, I mean, the kind of the most tangible relationships of control and domination and power that we experience is often at work on a daily basis. And how do we experience that? How often is that kind of filtered through class dynamics or race dynamics or gender dynamics or sexuality in some ways? How do you experience these hierarchies in your job and at different jobs? In many service jobs, direct domination of the kind that Marx was imagining you know, with the capitalist and the, and the worker, uh, like in the model of the factory, that kind of direct observation and domination isn't really viable in a lot of jobs, right? So in a lot of jobs in the service sector, you really need workers to be on board, right? And, you know, to really kind of want to be there in some ways, because part of what they're selling is this, you know, happiness, you know, the, 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 the pleasure of the whatever the service encounter is that you're working at. Right? And we also need, they also need workers often to have some kind of discretion, right, to deliver a good service, right? Or may, maybe even they need the inventive power and creativity of the worker. So you need to cut them some slack, right, not be breathing over their neck the entire time, but not too much, right, because you want to make sure that they're still profitable. So it's this weird sort of set of dynamics of releasing workers to be themselves, but also trying to capture whatever they do. And it just seems to me that in across all of these kinds of jobs on the job hierarchy, depending on how much autonomy you have as a worker, like there's still these experiences of control and hierarchy that are happening constantly in the workplace where we don't often talk about it. So I'm interested in, you know, particularly some of those jobs where you are given a fair amount of freedom, right? How does hierarchy get experienced in those kinds of jobs, right? Is it filtered through common cause? Is it filtered through friendship? I mean, what are the relationships like with these hierarchies at work? And I just think there's a lot more to understand about how, the, how that's experienced today so that we can think critically about them. So that's my first set of questions. My second interest is in the kinds of emotional labor that people do in their jobs, particularly the really hidden forms that don't get recognized, let alone you know, remunerated as part of the pay package. So the hidden abode of production that Marx was talking about was probably a, factor, a factory, and the possessor of labor power was probably a man. And in the 1980s, Arlie Hochschild wrote this really important book called The Managed Heart, where she coined the term emotional labor to try to register new forms of work in a post-industrial service economy um, with increasing numbers of women workers and more jobs available to everyone that had been understood as women's work, right? Jobs that involve a lot of serving, a lot of helping, a lot of supporting, a lot of catering to, right? So the definition of emotional labor for, for Hothschild is you know, the, you know, the use or display of a worker's emotions or appearance of emotions in order to induce a certain state of mind in someone else, a client, a customer, a student, a coworker, a boss, right? So you have to kind of manipulate your own, either your emotions or your appearance of emotions or affective states in order to facilitate the, you know, someone else feeling, having a certain kind of feeling state. And she says a lot more jobs require this. And, and again, I think there's just so many 
so, so much complicated emotional labor that we do that's not being sort of covered in the literature yet. And that's part of what I want us to do with our investigation too, is try to think about the forms of emotional labor. Hothschild saw that expectations of emotional labor were different for different genders. Um, women, for example, were more often expected to do deference work, right? And that was part of the emotional labor that was expected of them. Often men workers were, you know, expected to have a different kind of emotional register at work. Um, but as Hothschild noticed too, like emotional labor, when, you, when your job involves emotional labor, it can be really, really complicated. And I think that's when the borders between who you are as a non-worker and who you are as a worker get very blurry, right? So this is, this is a quote from Hothschild and she's talking about, you know, someone in a service job, like interactive service sector labor where you're supposed to smile and that kind of thing. So this is the quote. Seeming to love the job becomes part of the job and actually trying to love it and to enjoy the customers helps the worker in this effort, right? So put it simply, we become what we do in some ways. So it becomes a very complicated set of questions about who you want to be through the kind of work that you're going to be doing every day. So my questions here are about how different people in different jobs experience the emotional labor that's expected. And if we could even come up with like terms for these different like inflections of emotional labor that are expected of people. Are there gendered patterns that you've noticed? Is emotional labor something that's a burden or is it something that's welcome? To go back to Marx's original critique of factory labor, part of the description of why that work was alienating is because you don't bring enough of yourself into the work. And so there becomes this kind of disjuncture. Well, in a lot of these jobs, they want you to bring yourself to work, right? They want your personality. They want your emotions. They want your cooperative enthusiasm. Like, and so does that make work better, right? Or is that, that there's more opportunity to be alienated from all of those qualities that are now being instrumentalized for purposes other than your own, right? And then, so the last question is like, how does it impact your life outside of waged work? Like the kinds of emotional labor you're expected to do in waged work, how does it affect your life outside uh, waged work? So those are my questions. I would also like the intersection of Kathy's two questions. Like, how are the hierarchies at work mediated by requests of emotional or affective work? Yeah, yeah. Like, how do the yeah. two how do the two overlap and yeah. intersect with each other? Which would seem really interesting to me. So, my task here is a um, a question about work and time, or the relationship between work and our uh, lived experience of time. And so, I have a, a little setup for it, and then I have some actual. Um, questions to go around this, and I think in order to get at what I, to get at the present, the present situation and the current changes, I need to take a step back and talk about a previous shift in the, in the um, experience of time surrounding work. You know, so that's my question about how does work relate to our, to our experience of time or, or how does our experience of time get, get engaged in work? And so what I want to start with, just as the backup thing, is um, about what was new in the temporality of industrial capital. Like when industrial capital becomes dominant, uh, how did it change time? I'm thinking here of an essay written in the 1960s by the British historian E.P. Thompson about um, capital, industrial capital and time discipline. There's a third word in the title. Um, and what he traces, he, what he does, because he's a good historian, is traces the advent of clocks in England, like that clocks and especially watches were a rather recent invention. He starts, you know, questioning, tracing that and questioning why. And he explains that prior to industrial capital, people's inner sense of time was determined by work relations, but of course a different kind of work that didn't involve clocks. So that their time, their, their sense of time was either mediated by tasks, how long it takes to milk the cows, how long it takes to do a certain task, or by relationship to um, natural rhythms, like to the tides or to the sun. So the people's sense of time had these, um, had these uh, reference, really. With the advent of industrial capital instead, 
and the factory's need for precision, uh, synchronicity, efficiency, um, work developed a different relationship to time and specifically to clocks and to clock time. And so that the factory, you can easily imagine how the factory's uh, different components impose a kind of clock time on the workers through fines, time cards, uh, whistles, etc. cetera. Um, in addition to that, so that this, this uh, industrial time, a kind of what he calls a time discipline, is a quantified time of the clock. And one aspect of this that I would like to get into too as part of this is that with this advent of industrial time uh, and clock time with it, uh, also came the division between uh, work time and non-work time. That the invention of the working day, it, it essentially happens at the same time. Uh, with, the, with the notion that, that non-work time was a necessary time for social reproduction um, that, could, that would be accomplished then. So the interesting thing about this, now I'm still with the industrial part, is that it's not this new sense of time, new sense of time that's oriented around clocks, that's, that's uh, efficient and uh, quantitative in this way. It doesn't just affect workers and it doesn't just affect the factory. In fact, the hypothesis or axiom here really is that the dominant mode, the dominant uh, economic form, you know, so the factory here in that, in that period, um, dominates capitalist society also in its mode of temporality. So that this kind of relationship to time that workers have in the factory progressively spreads over the course of 100 years, also outside of the factory, and defines all of our relation to time. So that everyone began to live their lives by clock time and with time discipline and all its efficiencies. Like for instance, here's a super stupid example, but I, I think you'd have plenty others. Just, um, I remember in junior high, not only did we have you know, a, a rigid, um, uh, rigidly regimented day with classes and everything, and in some ways school was a, teaching us about time discipline in, in the same kind of regularities of the factory, even though the students at my school were generally not uh, destined to the factory, but other students had the rest of the day all completely mapped out too. You know, so it was not only that you had all the classes, but then from three to four o'clock was soccer, and from four to five o'clock was piano, and five to six o'clock was uh, ballet or something like that. And I think with generations after mine, it's even gotten more so, you know, that this relationship of the uh, precise temporality um, that's, that's really a kind of time discipline related to the clock. Um, is spread. So, but then here's when I come to my question. So, um, let's take for granted, or accept at least, this part that um, that during the uh, the the period of the domination of industrial capital, um, that there was uh, a new temporality, a new relationship to time that was in some ways based on the temporalities uh, uh, decided by the factory. How today? has our sense of time or our lived experience of time shifted? That's really my question. Um, given that industry is no longer uh, the dominant form. So let me try to even break that up into two questions. Um, the first question may be the easier, more, more accessible of the two, and it has to do with the working day. Um, because it seems to me that the working day that's, that's introduced with industrial capital is in, is in many ways transforming today. Um, that the upper reaches of the labor market I, I mean, I think uh, tech companies might be the most easiest for us to access about this or to think about this too. At these upper reaches of the labor market, there's um, becoming a, a, a progressive indistinction between work time and non-work time. Or maybe work time tends to expand. You know, you know how on the, on the, um, on the various, you know, like on the Microsoft campus, I remember this from, from, from decades ago, and I assume it's still the same, that there's a, 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 a pressure, both with, you know, brought with pleasure and, um, and other kinds of discipline to, in some ways, expand the working day. You know, it's not only on the connector bus, but also when you're at home, answering email, doing other sorts of tasks. So what I'm trying to point to here is a kind of a diminution or, or indistinction, let's say, between work time and non-work time. 
At the lower reaches of the labor market, there's a similar uh, breakdown of the working day, I think, um, to the extent that it ever really existed. Think of the kinds of precarious work um, that creates irregular patchwork days. Uh, you know, someone who might wait tables in the afternoon, who might be a security guard in the evening, uh, babysit children the next morning, something like that. There, too, the, the, uh, the definition of the working day is, um, is becoming more indistinct. So here's my hypothesis or question, maybe both about this, is, um, is, is the work, is, is, to what extent today is the, the definition or the, the distinction of the working day changing? Um, and I'm particularly interested in the time for reproduction. Like, it, to the extent that the time for reproduction is being whittled away or uh, being transformed, um, I'm wondering to what extent that changes aspects of our lives. You know, some, partly what I'm talking about here with this uh, indistinction of the, of the working day, there's some ways in which student life has some, in some ways expands, like the, even calling uh, these... Um, places of where tech workers work, campuses, uh, deals with part of it. I mean, student life in some sense uh, functions that way of the indistinction of the working day. I mean, students, students of course, are not always working, but they always feel like they ought to be working. Um, and maybe even when they're never working, they always feel like they ought to be working. Um, and so I w guess what, I think that there's a, there's a similar indistinction. That's what I'm, um, what I'm pointing to. I guess I'm, I'm thinking about the, the, the nature of the working day and the consequences of it. Oh, that's the first one. The harder question, the harder way of approaching the same question, really, is about um, the way that our sense of time is changing and no longer in line with the kind of factory discipline um, that I was uh, talking about earlier. And one way of approaching this is about the um, unbounded or or never-ending sense of time. Like one thing I don't think is changing is the relationship to quantification. Like in some ways our, our daily lives are hyper-quantified. Like that even your screen time is now totally quantified or the amount of time you spend on that phone call, all of that. It's not a lack of quantification. What I think there is instead is a, a changing relationship to uh, the kinds of um, divisions of the day. Like here I'm thinking of um, I found very useful for this a book published a few years ago by Jonathan Crary called 24-7. Uh, and he was um, referring how it's not only a dissolution of the working day, but all kinds of other definite times of life that are being dissolved. Like he was saying, <laughs> it used to be that you could only shop from, I don't know, eight to five or something like that. But now online, you can shop all night, you can, do, you can do email all night, you can do email wherever you are. There's a kind of, and he was posing this indistinction, like this uh, lack of boundedness, you know, the 24 seven quality, he's talking about it, leading to all kinds of sleep disorders, um, excessive medications, mental disorders, you name it, this sort of thing. But I think that the, what he's trying to get at is a different temporality, a different relationship to time that, that it seems to me um, corresponds. It's a way of uh, accessing the different relationship of time, to time we have um, in an age in which industry is no longer the defining factor. That's where, that's where I'm trying to go with that. Um, so w a couple people have mentioned that we're interested in, a, in, a, in this as a co- trying to frame this as a co-research project, which is super difficult when the light's up here and then start down there. But um, just to give you an idea of, of when I approach this, the, my experience of this notion of co-research um, comes from a tradition uh, in Italy, uh, co-research projects there that started with the fiat workers in the 1960s. And the idea was that sociologists going to work with workers going to study the workers, let's see, they were t tasked with studying the workers. And that idea was that it shouldn't be that the uh, sociologists were the investigators and the workers were in some ways the, the objects that they should, should inform them. That instead, and this is the hypothesis that I thought we should work with here, is that we're all equally capable of theorizing. And that what we have to, we have to uh, begin with the with the, in many cases, shared experiences, and that's what I, I'm hoping we could start with now in response to the 
to some of the questions we brought up, uh, start with experiences of your own job, but also jobs of others. I mean, I don't think you should be limited. It'd be lovely to hear things relating to your own jobs that, that fit with the kind of things we've been saying. Okay, fit with, that run completely counter to what we've been saying too, that's even better. Um, so starting with that, but our task is to draw on those experiences and recognize the structures that stand behind them. You know, to be able to use those experiences as a kind of theorizing. So I don't mean that you have to have uh, uh, completely formulated theoretical thoughts when you start, but I think uh, when, when we uh, could address some of the kind of work experiences that we've been talking about that we could be thinking of, the way of how that is indicative of uh, or leads us to understand structures um, that are heading behind them. Right, or that with all of these, you know, we start collecting people's, you know, experiences and reflections on it, then maybe we'll start getting some patterns too and maybe right. we can do some of that work of saying, well, what's going on here? This seems kind of similar to that or that seems dramatically different. So maybe we could together do some of that theoretical work too. And we can start that right now, actually. Okay. Let's so, um, I recently found out that the term wage slave is in the Gettysburg Address. And that, you know, people back in, in those times were very serious about it. You know, they, they really considered, you know, like uh, working for the man to be the same as chattel slavery and uh, or not much better, you know. And it actually took 100 years to brainwash or train the workforce so that they would accept going to work. Because people back in those days, you know, they'd go and, uh, you know, uh, have lunch and drink a bunch of beers and they just wouldn't go back to work, you know, uh -huh. because they weren't trained to do that. And uh, that's not a natural human condition. So, um, you know, and then, you know, uh, so a lot of us, you know, might, have a question about, okay, what is work? You know, like if you're working for yourself or let's say you're an artist like me, I'm a musician, but I recently figured out that I spend as much time moving equipment as I do playing a gig. And, and so uh, that's work. And, and so uh, it's so like, uh, how do we, what is, what's you guys, what is the idea of how we actually get away from work? Because I think that our society actually is sort of moving away from work because a lot of work is going to be doing done by machines and AI and all that stuff, and there, there's going to be an excess of labor, and and those aren't people aren't going to have money, and they're going to have to do something about that, you know. So, um, uh, like, what 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 would that actually mean? Just quickly, you said work was not natural. I want you to clarify that. Well, in other words, working for someone else. If you're uh, the, when they were calling it wage slavery, you know, they were uh, people that had farms and stuff, and the way that they viewed it, if you make a product, you know, and you sell that product, you're selling that product. But if you're working for the man, you're selling yourself, and that's the distinction. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any? Okay. 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 I want to talk about hierarchy and uh, time, especially the, the transformation of time. Um, I find hierarchy has been present in like throughout history. You've always had kind of leaders, you've had followers. Uh, I see hierarchy as kind of a means to direct human output um, in my workplace that involves like people uh, at the bottom layer kind of doing the individual rote tasks and people at the top kind of supervising and, and directing that output. So I think that hierarchy is, is necessary to accomplish something larger than individual individuals can accomplish. Um, I work for a tech company, uh, so my sense of time is flat. Um, when I'm asleep, other people are awake, they use my service, I'm on call for that service, uh, like maybe once a week out of every two months, I can be woken up any time from, you know, Tuesday morning till the following Tuesday morning. So I see that as a, Sorry, I'm shaking. Differentiating from when people were more in sync with natural rhythms because people depended on those natural rhythms for their means of, like, their means of uh, production. They relied on, you know, the tides to bring in food. They relied on uh, the sun and, and the seasons to bring in food. 
Um, here, I, I work for other people. When other people are awake, they want to use my thing. If it's not working, that's my problem. So, so you said flat. I yes. just wanted you to say a little bit more about that. It was just, it was to, uh, 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 um, time is flat. Striking. I mean, yeah. Uh, what is, say just more here, what that means. I think a lot of people think of time as secular or uh, yeah, yeah. cyclic. Um, you have you know times when you're active. You have times when you're sleeping. You have times when you want to uh, go to sleep and relax. And you have times when you want to work. For me, that's flat. Any time can be work time. Any time can be relaxing time. Um, and that's freeing in some ways because you're, when I'm not on call, when I'm not responsible for my service, um, I can di dictate my own hours. If I had a late night, I can come in at 11. If I had a, want to come in at 6 a.m., I can come in at 6 a.m. Um, but when I'm on call, I'm responsible for you know, my product and, and what brings food to my table. Just a short comment. My father once used the phrase, the dignity of a private sector job. Uh, I was working as a TA at the time, so evidently there are worthy jobs and unworthy jobs, just as there are real jobs and uh, real work and not real work. Hey, um, so my input is a question and then I guess one possible answer to that. Uh, so I guess my question has to do with flipping the title of this non-panel on its head which is, uh, you know, down with work, I want to ask about, you know, up with laziness. Um, <laughs> and so I guess I'm, I'm wondering what you all think about uh, types of laziness that are, you know, authentically, like, emancipatory. Like, there are ways to, like, qualify work. Um, like, there's work that needs to be done um, to resist, like, oppression, capitalism, whatnot. Um, but uh, yeah, what, what kind of laziness are you interested in? Um, and my possible answer to that kind of has to do with what you know, uh, Professor Weeks was saying about emotional labor. Like I have peers and friends in the service industry, I work in a restaurant um, uh, who are femme, who kind of take it upon themselves to be intentionally uh, unhygienic or unfashionable or unfriendly. Um, and that is sort of their personal, you know, immediately accessible form of resistance. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when I talk about it with, like, family and whatnot, they're, they condemn it as laziness. Um, so that's, that's just, my input. Could you just give a little more specifics about the sabotage? Oh, the sa I mean, like... <laughs> it's sabotage, right? You know? Like, I, I don't know. I'm making assumptions about other people. Like, you go into a restaurant, you don't want your server to be smelly, or, like, you want them to, like, tuck their shirt in. Um, uh -huh. And so I, I guess it's just like, yeah, subverting expectations about what service should look like, I guess. Right. Like, um, to what end someone should go to like make you feel comfortable about mm -hmm. receiving that service. Um, so yeah. Right. Okay, uh, there's a lot there and uh, all, everything, all the contributions here are quite lovely, um, but I want to add some research that I've done on my own, just like doing work and also talking to workers and trying to like sort of investigate Amazon and the working conditions of Amazon and Google. And I found this idea of like the necessity of hiding uh, these sort of abodes of production or something is like very crucial because part of the part of the whole ploy of Google is like uh, kind of embracing desire and embracing play in certain ways. Like in their offices there's slides, people have flexible hours, and it's sort of like one could say that they're trying to get everybody to be a situationist, but they're trying to like kind of like add a plop a vampiric squid or something on top of that and suck out the production. And in Amazon and other places, there is certain types of labor they intentionally try to invisibilize. Uh, there's plenty of programmers that are like have cush gigs and like get like the best like desserts or whatever like hand delivered to them from gig economy workers. But there's also coders that you're not allowed to talk about that, are, that wear yellow badges and are sent to like a building with no windows that do a lot of the grunt labor that uh, almost probably uh, never will be uh, more expensive to do with machines because machines, uh, you can't necessarily um, sort of outsource the resources of producing the machines in the same way you can a human. Like a human can like fall back on the state or like community or family or something or work all these other gigs whereas a machine needs certain things to run well and you can also, you can deprive that of a person better than a machine usually. 
Uh, and then with Amazon, obviously, it's the, the workers, like a lot of the workers that do like the sort of gig economy work or like distribution centers. Like you'll see the an Amazon centers all over the place and they try and like make themselves in, present in your home with Alexa and things like this, but they don't want you to know where their like, uh, centers are where these people are dying in the working conditions. They don't want you to know about these working conditions. And they, there's like things like this that are like hidden that like when you actually investigate them, it's like absolutely horrific. And I, like, it's like actually like it felt really powerful to just like, I don't know, make these things visible. And then like the point after that is what is to be done. And it seems uh, kind of pessimistic. But also another thing that I've thought about is like the algorithm itself as the new boss in the gig economy. Uh, and like there's people that went on strike I think in Spain that were, it was some, some sort of equivalent to Uber or Lyft. And their signs were specifically saying like down with the boss, down with the algorithm, like kind of conflating the two things that like they're not dealing with a person, mm -hmm. but there's a sort of algorithm that tells them what to do. And they were also conflating it with their leisure time because a lot of people don't necessarily think about this, but every time you're on Facebook, every time you're on Instagram, every time you're on your iPhone, you're giving, um, doing a sort of a service for these corporations in exchange for the service. You're, you're creating value that then they sell to people and you're giving them all this free labor. And that's 24 seven, that's another 24 seven like 365 kind of version of this where like, it is also, I mean, and also it's harnessing sort of desire where you're like, these things that I wanna be doing, this service that I want to have that I'm expressing myself in is like sort of captured and used to like commodify itself. And you're like, it is the new, it is a, it is a new form of uh, work that is being done. And it's also extremely obfuscated as such and w people see themselves again, like perhaps the w certain wage labor la wage laborers see themselves as this, but like they see themselves as like kind of doing a free productive thing that like they want to be doing, but it's within this like sort of like limited horizon. Um, right. We got yeah. and it, this is all great, but we have a we have a line behind you. Yeah, we okay. got it. Yeah, I just I'm sorry to do no, that. No, 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 it's it okay. It's heart. okay. It's totally fine. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, but thank you so much. Hello. Hi. Uh, I've seen a really strong sort of narrative arc and co like conceptual cohesion to your presentations. And I want to s tell you the story that I heard to see if it adds up, to, if what I add up to is something you agree with. Because um, I think we started with Peter talking about these sort of three constructions of labor um, and that there's things you have to do and things, you, things that are fulfilling, right, and, and other sort of categories. Um, and then Charles talking about this, the arrangement of things as they are today, uh, this, this, this illusion that the, a temporary blip of a configuration of society is, is the way we, that things naturally should be, right? Um, determinism of, of history. Um, and then, Kathy, you talked about emotional labor, and I, it was interesting because I think I, I'd never, I've heard a lot about emotional labor like in the internet about stuff, and I hadn't actually ever seen the Arlene Hothschild thing and so that 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 earliest definition of it as uh, like is so is sort of such a seed of, of how it sort of developed in, in the discourse um, where I think the worst of it now or the, like the the thing that really makes it flagrant these days is when it's uncompensated emotional labor there's sort of a there's a bit of a recognition that part of what we do with each other as humans is is emotional labor all, all the time and that it's when those the burden of that goes to people and is not compensated, that's, that's where it becomes unjust. Um, and then Michael, you're talking about sort of the uh, seeping of work into non-work time and the, and the boundary between work. Um, and what it adds up to me f and in sort of this sort of tension between compensated and uncompensated laborers is this idea that uh, capital and work uh, by valuing only very narrow slices of the labors that, that we do all the time and just as being humans, um, by valuing such a narrow slice of it, they're sort of saying that that's the only part of us that deserves to live, that like if you are not engaging in that part, that you sort of, that there's no part of you that deserves to survive. And so like all of these, all of these survival and social skills that we, that make our society function, most of them are uncompensated. Um, I think I'll stop it there. Mm -hmm. ah. okay. um, we should have had you as the concluding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, great. Thank you. Hi. Um, a lot. I guess a lot of the talk about emotional labor, uh, especially, resonated with me uh, when I was interviewing to work at Chipotle. The ma hiring manager told me that there are two types of people in the world: there are tiggers and there are eors. 
and we only hire takers. Oh um, my god. And so oh, this is Winnie the Pooh, right? Th this is Winnie the Pooh. Can you explain <laughs> it to me? I don't know. Yeah. This is Winnie funny. the Pooh. I would have been fine. Um, <laughs> Okay, everyone else knows it. Never mind. I'll yeah, figure this it out is later. Winnie the okay, Pooh. Tigger bounces up and down. Eeyore is clinically depressed. Oh. Uh, okay. Um, so, okay. Uh, so that was uh, that was one experience I had with emotional labor. Um, growing up, my my mother did call me Eeyore, but I did get the job and you know hung in there for a bit. Um, and then I, that feels like contrasted with my current work situation. Uh, like I work at a small nonprofit. And one of our, our issues that we've been talking about like amongst the staff is that we are expected to be sort of happy and peppy, not necessarily in presence of like the people we serve. Um, that the, when we're out doing our job, I think we all have like a real genuine human interactions with folks, but it's like within, the, within our organization um, as we're like sort of working, you know, we're dealing with a lot of heavy shit and but we're still expected to not, um, be frustrated with our management. And um, I think, yeah, but it was never, you know, and there's something there for me around like how explicit it was in the service yeah. sector and how like not explicit it is yeah. in like this nonprofit work environment, yeah. but still very necessary. Um, I, I kind of want to come at this from a totally different perspective. It was talk, sort of talk, uh, jumping off Charles's point about a lack of uh, discernible progress and technological advancement. But um, just like the notion that, um, for ex this recent study came out of this think tank called Autonomy, and I saw this in The Guardian, that just because of the sheer ecological calamity we're facing on like a wide range of fronts that we don't need to get into, that we just need to like dramatically reduce our working hours. And they suggested like they come to nine hours a week. I'm not sure how they came to nine, but sounds good to me anyways. Um, it would be great if, it would be great if they wouldn't need to be forced by like guys, you know, wrath on us. But it kind of also gets to me the point of the vast majority of I see uh, the work that's done, and there's much great work, seems to be just largely contributing loads of carbon to the atmosphere. And mm -hmm. on that nature alone, I mean, like, how often is this that even, as I see, very little being addressed? Um, so yeah, that's. Yeah. that's Thank you. So I was just thinking, um, this thing called time is like chopped up by people that have like a bunch of currency because they're in control of the currency. And if you have the currency, then you can get shelter and food. And if you don't, then um, you're on the fringes. So, like, they can chop it up that, like, I heard um, Amazon has, like, a warehouse in Poland, and they're treated not very nice, and then they sell to Germany. Um, and so they're treated better. Um, the people that consume um, are given customer service. And then the people that are hidden away, it doesn't matter what they present to the public because they don't even have to hide. Like uh, the factory workers that where they are um, chopping down that stuff for trees, um, the rubber trees, and then they're forced into factories to work. Those people are hiding, so they don't even have to put up a facade. So um, I don't know. I think um, now is the time that uh, we could use to... Uh, dis I'm glad we're talking about this, but I was... I was trying to get the point about the people space traveling, and then I think we call people that cross over the border aliens. I'm like, is he going to come up with this? Is about like we're supposed to be afraid of an alien when it's just a human like fleeing a gun. So, and then the guns are currency too. So, yeah. thanks. Hi, thank you for your words tonight. It's really, um, really good to hear. Um, so as a millennial, um, <laughs> something that, um, at least for me, was really uh, propagandized was, oh, just do your work with your passion. What are you passionate yeah. about? Do what you love. And, yes. And that's really hard to do when 40% of millennials are unemployed. <laughs> um, so uh, you brought up, you know, talk about your personal experiences. I really appreciate that. Um, so 
I want to talk about three people. Um, my sister is the type of person who just wants a job, and so she can arrive at work, do whatever she needs to do, and leave and go home, but don't think about it. And I think of that kind of person, I don't know if it's just, she's just a lazy person, and that's awesome, and I love her for it, or if it's just a byproduct of the isolation, whatever, of capitalism, and or what I think David Graeber calls bullshit jobs. Um, and then there's me, where I worked at a local nonprofit here, and I want to give too much away of identifying information, where a lot of people go into the nonprofit industrial complex because they want to save the world and solve all the problems, and yet you get people giving feedback to folks like me, like, I feel like you're not emotionally invested in the work, <laughs> even though I'm doing 60 hours a week, bitch. Um, <laughs> so... And then you have people like my husband, who works in the tech field, um, specifically in the games industry, where crunch is the norm. And for those who don't know what crunch, crunch is, yeah. yes. cr uh, crunch is basically um, mandatory overtime. It's all yeah. cool. We're all a family, and it's awesome. We have meals together. Don't worry about your real family at home. I mean, this is like, it's a chronic thing. I know it's really funny to laugh, but I literally know a story of a family who moved here from Bellevue to a studio, video game studio in London, not two weeks, and a, fam a family, two kids, parents, not two weeks later that studio shut down and they moved them to New, in New Zealand. So that thing happens all the time. So I think about crunch and the tech stuff and my husband who they say, yeah, we know we're in tech, we make a lot of money and we know we're coding our way out of future jobs. Um, so if you can just, you know, talk about all that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. That, that crunch thing is exactly why I don't make friends with people at work. But um, <laughs> so I, I work sort of in and around automation, and I think a lot about something that Alexandria Ocasio Cortez said recently. I'm paraphrasing here, but she sort of said that in a sane world, we would be celebrating automating away monotonous, repetitive labor. But because we live in this world that's teetering between extreme scarcity or some potential utopian scarcity. Um, we fear that. We don't know what we're going to do when we don't have jobs. Um, that goes into the idea of emotional labor. Where do you fill in the gap um, when the thing that you've held for so long is now gone? Um, that's just what I'm yeah, thinking. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah, um, sort of a piggyback on that, and I have to mention that I'm the last person in this round. Um, uh, as per Philip. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, um, so, so I worked at a grocery store for about five years doing customer service. Um, and during that time, uh, so grocery stores already operate on very thin margins. And during that time, um, uh, many other grocery stores in the uh, area were, were going to open, um, including Whole Foods. Um, and new seasons and Whole Foods getting bought out by Amazon. Um, but uh, during the time I worked in the grocery store, online shopping became um, uh, actually an enormous threat to all of our daily existence. Um, and I, I was working customer service and, and so part of my job um, became kind of maintaining a happy fiction that we all weren't possibly in a sinking ship. And, um, and I think that, um, that maybe is a larger status of, of especially uh, service sector jobs um, uh, at, uh, more and more relying on emotional labor, po possibly because the only lasting currency of a human in something like a grocery store is to provide um, uh, endorphins and dopamine hits to other humans to um, remind them that, that, that they're something of the social being. Um, and, and also maybe now, um, you know, so so I I, I guess I want to suggest that part of uh, an emotion, an aspect of emotional labor is is not only to defend the fiction that that uh, labor itself is um, a category that is is possibly sinking, as well as um, our own situation in in a, a global catastrophe where um, you know at, by the end of the 21st century all species are. Um, possibly going to die, um, so so kind of kind of defending the the fictions of the larger <laughs> world, sort of um, uh, in in chaos um, 
Yeah. yeah. That's it. Thank you. Um, I want to just ask just a real quick question. How much time do we have left or are we out of time? 15 minutes. Okay. So we got to deal with all of that stuff and we got 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> Yes. So should we, all, should we all respond? I, I want to say a couple. These were, that was so good. Yeah. Oh, my God, there's so much going on here. I guess just a couple points that I would say is that, you know, in relationship to the, you know, like being told constantly to find your passion um, and, like, as if that would be in a job, you know, I mean, just, like, I would, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to reform myself as a college teacher, you know, so now I just say try not to be horribly unhappy. Do what you can to not be as horribly unhappy. But I thought about that in relationship to the other one, the up with laziness comment. And I really like that too, but, you know, because thinking about, and I love the way you put it about, you know, the emancipatory forms, plural, of laziness and just recouping that word because that's sort of, you know, the opposite of the work ethic. It's sort of, you know, the, the worst thing you can be in some ways. And sometimes it's as if that, that's, that's what we're, threatened by if we're not consumed by work, as if there's two options, work or laziness, you know, the hammock in some ways. And so why not just like recoup it? Like instead of saying, no, no, we wouldn't be lazy in a post-work future, we'd be doing serious business. You know, I mean, well that just sounds like more work. You know, I mean, like there's just something suspicious about that kind of response. So I'm really tempted by this alternative of, well, no, let's talk about different qualities of laziness. You know, and really trying to sort of, I don't know, uh, revalue that term in some ways. You know, idle, idle sociality, you know, is a kind of, right, or idle, right, idle Idle gossip, idle talking, you know, all these ways of trying to recoup that in, you know, as a way to fight back against this find your passion kind of discourse. And the other thing was that, so the idea of the, the algorithm is the new boss. So like that's at one sector of the labor hierarchy and then at the other you get at crunch time, we're a family, right? I mean, is that, I mean, do you think that's the trend is that, you know, this kind of, the hierarchy gets completely depersonalized, so there is no, you're being ruled by a machine, you know, by this algorithm at one lab, end of the labor hierarchy. At the other end of the labor hierarchy, there's still this, we're a family, you need to be committed to us. And I'm just wondering if that's the way the labor market and the way it's being managed is kind of sort of uh, working out today. And then the last one is just about, I mean, I think that's really important about thinking about work as damaging the environment. You know, I mean, that that's leading to crisis because often, you know, when we talk about ecological crisis, we start thinking about consumption. Oh, you shouldn't consume this, you shouldn't consume that. No, you shouldn't be producing is what you shouldn't be doing. You know, I mean, like, let's talk now not about the level of exchange, but the level of production. And that's another way to get at, you know, what's really driving the engine of ecological crisis and, and what would be involved in its remedy. So those are my points. I've just got a little. <laughs> mine are more, yeah, I, I too thought that was, really, that was really fascinating and mine are really just further questions for the ones. Like I, I was really interested that three, you know, there are three, at least three, um, uh, of the interventions about that emotional work and the need to be upbeat, in fact, two relating to nonprofits, you know, and then, and then the grocery store at the end, but none of you were, were talking about the gendered nature of it. And I'd be interested to, to I mean, it was three women who were doing those three interventions, but, I, but um, I'd like to hear more or think more about the ways that gender is enforced to be performed at work, especially with regard to these um, these kinds of emotions, you know, like the the need to be upbeat, the need to feel, you know, at a at a nonprofit, for instance, of of um, you know being positive about the work, but also I assume it, it's a certain kind of uh, um, work to encourage each other. That's partly what's going on with that, and it's needed anyway. I, I would that's something I'd love to find a way to talk more about. You know, another thing I don't, I still don't can't my, uh, wrap my head around is this notion about flat time. 
Um, I like this, and or I mean, I mean, I don't like it actually. It sounds horrific to me, but it, it's so the it's the perpetualness of it. I think that's flat. That's what I'm trying to get at. Is what's flat rather than than it's vertical, like no, rather than cyclical. Rather than cyclical. Like a okay. Day and then another day. Ah, right. Okay. So that the perpetually on call, you know, at least yeah. for this week, is um, is non cyclical. I mean, so what, because one of the things I'm interested in in this question about temporality, and, and no one was, I, I didn't bring it up explicitly enough, but I guess, and maybe that's the reason, because I'm wondering, like, what it seems to me, I had understood that part of the nature of the working day was that it did leave time for reproduction and recuperation. You know, that the, at least that was, you know, the ideal that never existed for only the most elite workers, you know, was the slogan for a while, at least in a syndicalist tradition, was, you know, eight hours of work, eight hours of leisure, eight hours of sleep. That was the 24-hour day. So um, when you take away non-work time, like in, this, in that flat week, what happens to your reproduction? Like, I don't mean just who washes your clothes. I mean, um, what happens to your, you mentally? Like, that's partly what I'm thinking of is this, is the um, is the difficulties created from the the kinds of temporality that uh, the, the the perpetualness of these uh, of certain kinds of kinds of work. So the flatness of it, I, I'm going to go with the flatness. I'm I'm learning that, and I learned about Winnie the Pooh too. So that's another um, <laughs> lack of mine. Uh, maybe maybe I should stop with that and give it to you, Peter. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, that was where all, those are all really great, and I can't really do justice to everything everyone said. I've been trying to just sort of, uh, yeah, the, the crunch and the, yeah, the, the flat time, I think we're all going to be sort of bou bouncing around on that one. I mean, so I'm just going to try and relate it to, to sort of the themes that I was, uh, this, that were coming out to me about, like, what are the things that we are that you know are sticking in our craw about work that we want to talk about that we want to think about and you know so one of the things was you know there's all we're talking about new ways in which work expands temporally into being always on call it expands in terms of what's expected in terms of emotional labor and the way that that emerges in this through service work and the way it's gendered very much so but in another way we're still talking about what i think is the core you know, certainly Marx's point that Kathy kind of laid out about, you know, work in its capitalist form as unfreedom, basically. And I've, there, I still don't have any other way to say it. It can sometimes, you know, it seems almost like too simple to, or like it's too, you know, the freedom. It's been such a sort of a corrupted concept in American culture, certainly. But, you know, in the sort of the traditional Marx factory industrial labor version that Kathy's talking about, it's very clear in, in the sense of like, the boss buys the right to have you for a certain amount of time, and then they tell you what to do. And there's someone, you know, and so that's the point. Someone made the point about you know wage slavery as an idea that yes, we are not chattel property of someone else. We're not serfs, but nevertheless, for a certain number of hours, we are not free in the way that we're told we're free in sort of American civic education. And in a sense, that's what we're talking about in all these other ways, where it's not necessarily that you're the boss is coming to you and saying do this or you're fired but it's you're expected it, you know you're expected to produce spontaneously or with the illusion of spontaneity a certain form of labor and that that comes you know in all the ways you know these especially gendered ways as with Arlie Russell Hochschild's work you know canonically talking about flight attendants and and work like this but you know you think about the way this goes into any kind of work even before one is fully an employee you know i think those of us who've gone to, certainly who are my age, have gone to job interviews, and you know that you're expected to go into a job interview, no matter what kind of crap job it is, and pretend as though something personally will be fulfilling to you about cleaning toilets or phone, making cold calls, you know, to sell insurance or working at Chipotle or whatever it is. Right, denying people insurance. You have to talk, not only do you, you can't just say, I will show up every day and do the job, and I am a warm body who knows how to read. No, you have to say, no, this is my passion. You know, before you've even been hired, you have to do that. And so that what we're still demanding is freedom from that, right? And so this gets to sort of the other thing that I wanted to touch on is this 
this thing, you know, somebody mentioned uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her comments about automation. You know, she's also a fan of Star Trek, I know, so I, I feel that sort of sense of why can't technology be used for human freedom rather than for, you know, our further <coughs> exploitation. And so I want to just throw out quickly, this, uh, there's sort of, there's two themes that run through sort of left socialist critiques of work <laughs> that you'll often see, one of which can be portrayed as, you know, full automation, full laziness. We just want to, we just want, you know, no more bosses, no more time on the clock, time to do whatever we want. And the other one is we want to do work which is truly fulfilling. We want to take up our time with the stuff that truly is good for us and good for the people around us and good for the world we want to build. And I would submit that in a sense, those two arguments in a capitalist context are the same argument. They're approaching the same problem from opposite sides, which are that what we do, whether in its traditional factory sense or in its more modern iterations of being either constantly on call to the customer of your app or required to put forth emotional labor, we are enmeshed in these systems of unfreedom that we want to reject for something else. And what, whether, how, whether we can even describe that something else as laziness or as you know, liberated, unalienated labor is almost impossible for us to imagine from the standpoint of, uh, of a form of society in which most of our time is taken up by something that is not that. And so that's why this sort of this negative moment, this provocation of down with work, I think is sort of necessary. And I think that's sort of come out in a lot of the comments that people have made. Wow. Uh, as I said, I'm going to make uh, just a really quick comment. Uh, and then we're going to have to shut down the whole show because um, of time. Um, <laughs> capitalist temporality. Um, I, um, I wanted to say one thing quickly. It concerns the the grocery store the, um, and the, the sort of um, the changes in, in that in that industry, which employs, I think, um, a huge section of the of the job market. I mean, it's considerable, and it is under pressure at the moment. And but what's sort of interesting to me is. Um, is the uh, introduction of self-checkout machines, and I want, and uh, they're sort of presented as an advancement. This goes back to my old argument of the aliens. You know, the aliens must have self-checkout machines in, on their planet. I mean, if this is, this is what it, this will, we have to conclude that. But um, or else, how do they get a spaceship, right? Um, and this is what I want everybody to really consider, right? And um, but if you, what, what, what does a self-checkout machine do? And it's fascinating. I mean, you have to sit down and consider them, because um, essentially they make you work for nothing. The, and that that idea that that you think you've moved ahead and made progress by packing your own bags, <laughs> that is some impressive. Shit. Right? I mean, you, you, you have to imagine, like, how did we, and that's what they sell. I mean, they, they recently removed them out of PCC, but if you look, and now they have a, um, cameras, um, if you look at the new QFCs, where they do another job on you, which is, now, I think, very interesting for us to everybody to think about. And I, we didn't, I, I wanted to get into this, but I'm, I'm not. But what they, so they have these self-checkout machines which make you do the work, which was once, um, you know, done by labor, but you do it for free. And uh, they make you feel like you're, you know, doing it on yourself, but uh, by yourself. But then the other one is now they have cameras. <clears throat> when you when you get close to when you walk down an aisle, they turn on. And so then they got rid of the uh, police, uh, the, the the theft, the, what is it, the loss protection, loss prevention officer. You now have to do that job because you see yourself. They actually, it's very quite amazing. You actually watch yourself shopping, right? <laughs> And, um, and so it's one more job down the road. And, and, it's, and so the big question is, how do we get a moment where we, we, have, a, we have a consciousness uh, molded in this fashion? And I wanted just to end on that point, is that we, we, don't, we, we often have to think, and this is Chris, Chris Arthur, who sort of brings this up and, um, as, uh, in, by way of Kant, but he starts to think about the way that we, consciousness is not, is, not, is, not, is not fixed, at least for humans. It's very plastic, uh, or very plastic. And so, um, when we when we see machines like that, um, they're molding the way we go through the world. They mold our our experience of time, as Hart said here, and uh, and also um, of self. And we start to believe that these systems, um, in the in the case of um, crunch, and that they become natural. Right, and they, the, the, our minds become um, suited or fitted 
for that experience. And it becomes very difficult to imagine how to break out of a way of thinking, particularly because we're so plastic. We confuse this plasticity with the natural. And that's the difficulty that we face. So I'm going to close on that comment. And thank you for everybody, because this is a very marvelous conversation from everybody on here and Southern So, uh, so uh, I will officially call the first uh, convocation of the Red May Work Research Group to a close. But it's obviously not the last one, since there, the topic has been by no means exhausted. There is further research to do on it in bars, in bookshops, wherever we happen to meet next, whoever we are, we will all be thinking about it. And I do want to suggest a Red May contest for either town hall members or uh, pub uh, children at public libraries, if we can do it. We s simply ask someone to uh, finish a story that begins, the spaceship lands, the alien steps out, some kid says, you guys obviously don't have money, you obviously d don't work, how do you spend your day? And your job as a writer is to come up with the best answer, and we'll give a prize for it. Uh, tomorrow night, 7 p.m., Chile, 1973, Seattle Labor Temple. Thank you for coming. Fan the flames of Red May, everybody online.